Welcome everybody to the second week of Pascha. Uh, today's uh, initial lecture will be on Toric Varieties by Jose Gonzalez, who is visiting us, visiting us from the University of California at Riverside. Well, welcome Jose and uh, thank you. Thank you, Luis. And I would like to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to give these talks. I really like this topic, so I hope that I convey my enjoyment for the topic to you, and I hope you like it as well. Okay, so the title is Lectures on Toric Varieties. And again, my name is uh, Jose Gonzalez. You can just call me Jose or anything you like. So then the main reference for the lectures is this one by same title, Lectures on Toric Varieties by David Cox. I think it is a very nice uh, source because uh, the examples are very carefully like, chosen. For example, later, when you see the later examples, they connect to the earlier ones. So these notes are very well written. We are going to uh, follow those closely. It has two additional sections that you don't see here. So the sections that we will cover are section one, called toric varieties, larices and cones. Section two, the toric variety of a fan. Section three, homogeneous coordinates and toric ideals. And section four, polytopes and toric varieties. So what are the two extra sections? Section zero is on background. In case there are some things that maybe I mentioned here and you are not familiar with, uh, we can talk together about this afterwards, but also you can look at the document. Also, the document is helpful because the slides are really nice because they allow you to show lots of material, but unfortunately, they go away too fast. And sometimes you would like to see a little bit more before the slide is moved. So you can just uh, download these ones or just use it uh, on your mobile device. And then you can see what I'm saying and they just go back in the slides. Well, that one is not in the form of slides. And it's almost the same, but um, that one you can see what I'm uh, writing here uh, if I move too fast. Then let's start. Section one has the following title, Toric Varieties, Lattices, and Cones. So we are going to start with the definition of what we are going to cover in these lectures. Is this one of toric varieties? A uh, small difference with the notes of Professor Cox um, is that um, in the terminology, like nowadays, usually one, when one says a toric variety, it includes this assumption, like normal. In his notes, that assumption might not, uh, is not there. Like he uses the word normal uh, additionally, he says, uh, when he says toric variety, it might not be normal, and when he wants it to have the assumption of normal, then he includes that word. Okay, so what are these? So a toric variety is a normal variety where you have this set, uh, the complex numbers removing zero to the n. So in CN, you have all coordinates different from zero. You have that one as an open set in the topology that one uh, usually uses in algebraic geometry, the Sariski topology. Additionally, let me point out that this one is called the algebraic torus. And one usually denotes that one by T. So you have that one as an open subset of your variety. Oh, this is so strange. Maybe it's lag. I mean, maybe it will show up later. But thank you for pointing that out. I see. So yes, it's lag. It's just lag. It's unfortunate. I think maybe we can connect differently tomorrow. Or we are doing it like uh, several steps, which I think that tomorrow we can do in fewer steps. And then the lag would be less. Thank you for pointing that out. So. This one acts on itself by multiplication coordinate by coordinate. So that one is, an, is a group. And it's even an algebraic group because the multiplication is given by a morphism. The inverse is given by a morphism. So that one acts on itself. And then what you are going to ask is that, unfortunately, there will be lag here. When I draw x, you have your T as an open subset inside. I ah, don't no lag anymore. And then this one acts on itself, which is the, the group operation. You are going to ask that it also acts on the whole space, on the whole variety. You are going to ask that T 
acts on X, but in such a way that the open subset T is invariant. So there is an action of T on T, because it's invariant, and you ask that this action of T on itself is the one that is multiplication coordinate wise. And that is what we are going to call a toric variety. And here, by variety, we mean an affine variety, projective variety, or any abstract variety. Two examples that we are familiar with. Um, affine space, Cn. This one is a toric variety. If you look, it satisfies these conditions up here. But with what action? Well, you just take one element of these torus, meaning these Ti's are complex numbers, non-zero, each of them, and if you have a n tuple of complex numbers, then you act multiplying this one with this one, and so on. Just coordinate wise. And here for the lectures, we are using, we're working over the complex numbers, but I would like to point out that we do not need to work over the complex numbers. This would, this would go fine over any field, even more so like people do it over any ring and it works fine. Many of the results that you prove over rings would not be as strong, but the definitions and some of the results would make sense over there as well. Okay, so now let me mention this other example. X0 to Xn, the homogeneous coordinates on Pn. So we take projective space, meaning you start with a vector space of dimension n plus 1, you remove the origin, and then now you identify points that are on the same line through the origin. That gives us this variety called projective space. And that one is a toric variety as well. Like, how are we going to give it the action? Well, inside this Pn, you can put uh, vectors like this. You include it as one in the first coordinate and Ti's in the other ones. Then that way, we get an identification between this torus and uh, Savisky open set, which is from Pn, remove this. And then take this multiplication. T1 to Tn, acting on a tuple with one more uh, element just multiplies in these ones here. And then you just check, like, um, when restricted to the Zariski open that we identified with this one, it's just multiplication coordinate by coordinate. And this one is a normal variety, it's even smooth. Then we have what it says over here. Very good. So then, before I continue, I would like to point out the historic varieties are an important class of varieties that can be studied with combinatorics. And we are going to see that during the lectures. Then they provide a nice introduction to uh, algebraic geometry, commutative algebra, and also are very useful when you're doing research to work out examples. We are going to now talk about two lattices that we use to describe toric varieties. They are going to be called M and N. Let's first talk about the one called N. So, a lattice is a free abelian group of finite rank. And then, what are we saying over there? Well, pick a basis. If you pick a basis as Z module, then you are just saying that you have a copy of Zn. And then, uh, if we take home to Z, home over Z to Z, we get another copy of Zn. It's isomorphic to Zn. Uh, we're not, in general, going to choose a basis. A basis, And that dual, we're going to call M. So the one that we start from, we're going to call it M. And then the dual of that one, we're going to call it M. Then there is a pairing. Because if you have an element of M, and you're given an element of M, one of them is like uh, functions from the other one to z. So it makes sense to evaluate and get out an integer, right? Then uh, let's use a notation for that. We could use like notation of evaluation of functions. But yeah, maybe that gets a bit confusing later on. So to emphasize that there is kind of a duality between these two, we are going to prefer this notation. So if you have an element of n, this u comes from n and this one comes from M, 
meaning it's a function that goes from n to z. Then m evaluated at u, we are denoting like this throughout. So this is the same as m evaluated at u, which gives you an integer. OK. Then if we, again, pick up bases and we choose uh, the dual bases, uh, for m, we get an isomorphism, as we just pointed out before. And then this evaluation, when you have a basis on one, and for the dual, you choose just the dual basis, this is just dot product. We are familiar with this fact. Now, then, let's do the following. If we have the lattice n from the beginning, and then, uh, again, we fix an isomorphism, notice that the following happens. Tensor over z with uh, c star. Well, this is z plus z plus z plus z. Then what we get is c star plus c star plus c star n times. Very good. But then let's do it without choosing a basis. We just now saw that it is isomorphic to this. So this is just the torus. Even if I don't choose the basis, it's still isomorphic to this, right? So then we get this one. And as I was pointing out, we call that one, this is an algebraic torus. But we're going to say that this is the torus associated to the lattice n. And then let's write a relation with the torus for the two lattices. This is why I was saying that it sometimes moves too fast. So some of you might want to st the last part to stay longer. So then again, you can just go to, like in Google, you go to uh, David's, David Cox's website. And then over there, you can see uh, the notes. We follow them. I make some small changes, but it's uh, pretty close. So first, choosing u in the lattice. So if you want to keep it like uh, down to earth, just think that we have here zn all the time. Just think of a tuple of integers, if it helps you. Then, what happens here? We have uh, one parameter subgroup of tn as follows. Given a t from c star, then consider this which we lay in here, which is Tn. Then you see that what you get is a subgroup of Tn. And additionally, we is described by one parameter. So then we call it a one parameter subgroup of Tn. Again, to make things more concrete, fix coordinates for a moment. If you fix coordinates, meaning fix an isomorphism of your lattice with Zn, then what happens? We, your u would look like this. It's a, just a tuple of uh, integers. And then in that case, this map from above looks like this. It's just like your one parameter to the first integer here, and so on to your parameter to the last integer. And then now, we did first choosing an element from n. What if we choose an element from m? We are going to get what's called a character. We are going to get a group homomorphism, but now from Tn to C star. How is this going to happen? <coughs> Given m in m, lowercase m in the lattice, uppercase m, we can take the following. We need to say how to act on an element from here. But the elements from here, since this, since this one is n tensor C star, those elements look like this. So we define this character as follows. The product from all of these, 1 to L, of um, T on this. Very good. This is a character, meaning that we have a, homomorph a group homomorphism from this 1 to C star. And then we see that M is the character group for the torus. It's something that one can work out. If, again, you fix coordinates and your M, when you identify lowercase m, if you identify uppercase m with Zn and assume that this lowercase m is a tuple of integers b sub i's, 
what does this character look like? It would send a tuple of elements, uh, complex numbers non-zero. It would send them to the first one, to the first one, the second one, to the second one, and so on, all multiplied. That one inside C star. Inside a uh, C star. <coughs> and you can see it's a group homomorphism. Very good. Very good. When we have, ah, there is a little bit of lag. That's not the page I'm showing. It might be. So let me go and do this. Thank you. I have an idea. So if I stop mirroring and then start mirroring again, I think I'll be nice. Thank you. OK, so then. Very good. Yes, I don't know for how long it was frozen. <coughs> oh, it's funny because it erased. I, I wrote a little bit on top of this one. Let me see. Oh, no, I just wrote that one over there. It's just okay. minuscule, <laughs> like over here. Very good. I think we can easily bypass one device tomorrow which would reduce the lag. We'll do that. OK. Then I was moving now to this slide here. Let's look at the localization of the polynomial ring. In case this comma should not be here. Look at the localization of the polynomial ring at the product of the variables. In other words, just that write it like this. The elements from here, uh, this is called the ring of Laurent polynomials. And these ones that we got in the previous slide are just called Laurent monomials. And it is convenient to have the following notation. So we write t for all of these ti's. And m was just this tuple of exponents. So it is convenient to have a more compact way to represent this Laurent monomial. We are going to write it just as t to the m. And then again, they are in this ring over here. And then there is like this correspondence between domains that are finally generated as C algebras and affine varieties. We can see which one this is. So before the localization, this polynomial ring corresponds to affine space, affine space Cn. So the polynomial ring corresponds to the variety affine space n. And then what is happening over here when we do this localization, the affine variety that would correspond to that domain that is finally generated as a k-algebra would be removing this product of the ti's, like the, this vanishing set of. So you see, we just get the torus. But let me call it without the n. We just get the torus, you see? You're removing uh, the points in affine space with where any of the coordinates is 0. In general, what is the structure of a toric variety? It's going to look as follows. It's going to have a big open set. So in affine varieties in the Sariski topology, the where variety includes irreducible, so every open set is dense, so they have the big torus, and then they have some extra like strata, and that one is going to be given by combinatorics that is very like very concrete, and we will describe it during these lectures. So is the torus? Yes, please. I think I might have known something uh, wrong on the last page. Sorry, Do you want me to go back? Certainly, I'll be very happy to. I did. Very good. In the it was like fourth line, uh, chi to the m of the sum. One, two, three, four. 
Should that T on the product have a subscript I? I am thinking that you're right. Because for this one, yes, you're right. I want these ones to be TIs. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes. Okay. These ones should be just complex numbers that multiply, and you end up in, yes, you're right. Yeah, like these ones are now integers. Then we want over here a um, just a complex number that you raise from integer. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, you are completely right. Then over here, we were looking at uh, what the toric variety looks like. It has the big toes plus some extra boundary stuff. And in the case of the alpha toric variety, the extra stuff is determined, we will see this, uh, by which characters extend to functions on the variety. And then let's see this with an example. Before the example, let me write down something over here. To just to say what that paragraph is telling us. So we have the variety x, and we are looking at some maps to C star that are defined not in the variety x, but here on the torus. And then what we are asking is, if you have one of these high to the u's, where u comes from m, u comes from m, and you have a chi to the u, is defined on the torus, then we are asking, does it extend to the whole x? That's the question that you are asking. And from there, asking this question will allow us to get some combinatorial objects. These u's live on a lattice. So if we have an affine toric variety, we are going to assi assign to this affine toric variety the set of those u's for which this map extends. I can write down the same uh, at the bottom. We have t, and this t is mapping to C star with this chi to the u. And then this one gets included inside some x. And then we are asking if we can extend this map all the way to x. That's what this paragraph is telling us. It's just a question. It's asking, does this happen? The answer is that for some u, it does. For some other u's, it will not happen. But then you put together the set of those u's, and it will give you a combinatorial object that we will be studying. It will give you, a, a, after you take the cone over that, it will give you a, a cone with some special properties, but that's coming soon. Then the first example here is we take the toric variety affine space that we looked at mo a, a moment ago. And then what happens in this case? Well, for affine space, that one we get out of taking simply n and m equal to zn. And then we can identify characters and Laurent monomials. The Laurent monomial t to the n, using the notation we introduced at the top, uh, determined by this tuple of n equals b, extend to this function extends to a function from c n to c. Let's think for a second. If this is the definition, when would this give you a well-defined complex number? Well. This is what you need, is if and only if the vi's are greater or equal than zero. You see, because if one of those was smaller than zero, you're in trouble, right? You'll have like some division by zero over there. And if these are all greater or equal than zero, yes, it does extend, is, is well defined, and if one of them is negative, you have trouble because of division by zero. So then this makes sense. And then below, we will construct this uh, cn used, as, again, as a new example later on to see how you can recover CN from the Laurent monomials. One more example is that if you have uh, two toric varieties, X and Y, then so is the product. And then this way you can see that PN cross PM is a toric variety. And then how can you see that this is true? Uh, I'll leave it as an exercise, but I can tell you a word. Uh, we just look at the definition. We want a torus living as an open set in this product. But how can we do that? Well, simply take the torus of x cross the torus of y. 
And then you see that this is just like a bigger T. This is still isomorphic to uh, C star to some M plus N. If this one was like C star to the M, and this one was C star to the N, then this one would be a, just like a bigger torus. The product of two open sets on this product is an open set of the product. Product of normal varieties, one can easily show, is normal. And then you define the action on the product as this T is one element from here, comma one element from here. So make the first uh, element act on the first component, and the second element act on the second component. You get a well-defined action. And when you restrict it to the open set Tx cross Ty, um, is the same action of multiplication coordinate wise because the action of Tx on itself was that and the action of Ty on itself was that. So that's how you can see that the product of toric varieties is again a toric variety. One more example over here. Let's consider inside um, a finite space of dimension 4 in C4 the variety defined by this irreducible polynomial. This one contains the torus via, via this map over here. Send T1, T2, T3 over here. T1, T2, T3, and the product with T here to the T3 to the minus one. And then you ask the, the question from the previous slide. Which Laurent monomials TM extend to functions from V to C? OK, then let's look at this. Um, I guess what I want over here is um, with the possibility of extending like this. So let's look at that question over here. When can we extend this function? When can we extend a function given by a t to the m from the torus to this whole variety? So we see, let's look at two cases. Let me write down the cases separately. So here is going to be the first case, starting over here, up to here, and from here to here is the second case. So the first case is easier to see. If we have that, let's see the notation again. We are considering a Laurent monomial, t to the m, what is m again? m is just a tuple of three integers, a, b, and c. And what's this, what does this notation t to the m mean again? Well, t in this case is coming from, uh, is going to be this, is going to be like x to the power a, y to the power b, times y to the power b, times a, z to the power c. We get the function over here. We see that if a, b, and c are greater or equal than 0, we have no problem at all, right? So this function would be well defined on this whole variety. So no problem at all over there. But now the issue can only come from here. These three first, first three coordinates are fine in any event. The one that can cause trouble is this one. And it will cause trouble when our C is negative. Then in that case, let's see what we can do. Suppose that, suppose that C is negative. But suppose, like I, I guess at the beginning when one is writing this, one still doesn't know that these are the ones that you need to consider, but that comes from the computation below. Let's look at this line below first, and then you will see that why, where this a plus c and this b plus c come from. 
since we are in this variety, the coordinates on that variety satisfy this relation. So if we have x to the a times y to the b times uh, z to the c, over that set, we have this. So we can write that these two are equal on a certain open set. And then if I have c less than zero, and I have this one and this one greater or equal than zero, I am not going to look at the middle one. I am going to look at this function. I look at the function on the right hand side. That one makes sense, is well defined on the whole variety. And then I'll argue that it is the equal to this one. The reason is that they agree on some open set. So then they have to agree on the whole variety. So this function indeed extends the one that I started from. So this one is a function with these assumptions that C is less than zero. A plus C and B plus C greater or equal than zero. If I look at the function over here, this one makes sense. It's a well-defined function on the whole variety to the complex numbers. It's a morphism from the whole variety to the complex numbers. And it does extend the original one because it does on some open, non-empty open set. I can, and then I can see that they have to be equal. And then we will see that those inequalities, like no, these ones that we see over here, a greater or equal than zero, b greater or equal than zero, a plus c greater or equal than zero, and b plus c greater or equal than zero, define the dual cone. And these come from putting together the two regions that we covered over here. All of them greater or equal than zero, also with the possibility that when C is negative, you need to have these two conditions. Very good. Good question. Yes, please. Um, what, maybe it's obvious, but why didn't you have to consider a case where, say, P was also less than zero? Let me see. So there are two, two parameters less than zero, C less than zero and B less than zero. I guess. My problem over here was with division by zero that came from this one. Okay. So if I if I was to evaluate over there, my issue comes where this one would, yeah, that's where the division by zero would come from. Okay. Very good. Okay. Yes, please. Um, why did you, maybe I missed something, but why did you choose the function of V to be X to the A, Y to the B? I think that there would be other ways to get a function, but what I wanted was to cover the case where C was negative, and then I think there would be other ways to do it. There would be other presentations. Yeah, this is a possible way where I can show you that where in this region over here, it extends. What the ultimate goal was, was to see that it does extend for these ones here. Like the answer is these ones over here. Okay, so you're saying for that particular function on D, uh, these conditions are necessary for it to extend? Or... Yes, like it, it's precisely in this case that the function extends. Yeah, we'll, the examples are connected, so we will come back to this example. What um, we will come back to, like this part here, is something that we'll see in a future example. That the answer to when it extends is precisely what you see over here. So, given a, one of these varieties, like a toric variety, a variety that has the torus inside and the action of the torus extends, one asks that question, one produces something defined by inequalities like this. And the claim is that for this particular one, when we come back to it in a future example, we are going to see is this. Um, we can, in case you are not familiar with weighted projective space, we can talk about 
That one after the lecture and also during the discussion section with uh, Javier that we are going to be meeting in the afternoon. Um, that one, you will construct, um, here we have a description. Let's consider weighted projective space uh, denoted like this, P with some weights. If these weights are all ones, it's just the usual projective space. Here is just a more general version where we have positive integers and we, we are going to assume that uh, they are going to be relatively prime. It turns out that we could assume something stronger. We could assume that they are pairwise prime uh, because one can show that for each one of those with, as they are here, just asking that they are all prime, one can do some reductions and pass to an isomorphic version for some other QIs where they are also pairwise prime. The construction is as follows, is similar to projective space, but with an action that is slightly different. The lambda doesn't scale like everything on a line through the origin. The, the lambda will scale slightly different. The definition is you take Cn plus one, you remove the origin, and you identify by an, a certain equivalence relation, you identify two tuples when there is a lambda non-zero, a complex space, a complex number non-zero, so that if you multiply the coordinates of one of them by lambda to the q0, lambda to the qn, where the qis are the ones over here, then you get the other one. Again, it helps thinking for a second of one, 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 one. Then you will recover the usual definition of projective space. We can see uh, the image of this guy in here. The image of the guy, this guy in there is the quotient of this one plus C star. If we regard C star as a subgroup, of the torus to the um, of C star to the n plus one, included via this map. Let me read that line again. So the image of this one in this one is this quotient, and here we are regarding C star as a subgroup of this one via this map. Then by making now you can choose coordinates essentially. Take this Q1, Q0 to Qn to be the first column of some matrix and then complete it to an invertible matrix over Z that you, that you can always do. And then let's use that matrix to define an automorphism of this one. Yes, because we have an invertible matrix over the integers. Then perfect, that gives us an automorphism of this guy used by matrix multiplication with these ones thought of as vectors. And then you can see that in that case, this quotient gives you precisely this. We just chose a certain way so that we can see that we are just basically uh, killing one of the coordinates. And then we get this. Uh, via this isomorphism, the action of Cm plus one starts on Cm plus one removing zero descends to an action here. You see, because if you have elements in the same class and then you act in this way, the images also have the same class. To see that again, we see what the equivalence relation is. The equivalence relation identifies a tuple with another one that you get the same values by multiplying by lambda to the QIs. What we are saying at the bottom is that that passes to equivalence. And it is because the, the action is being multiplication coordinate wise. So then when you, uh, by multiplication by these guys, coordinate wise. So if you have two things in the same class and you act, the images are in the same class. Very good. So it descends to the quotient. And then it shows that this one is a toric variety. Yeah, we just saw that there is this one inside as an open set. And we have an action of the torus and restricted to uh, the torus itself is multiplication coordinate wise. 
now we are going to link these varieties uh, to combinatorics. We are going to talk about cones, the duals of those cones, and faces of those cones. Then our first definition is as follows. We are going to define a convex polyhedral cone. We are going to be working on a vector space over the real numbers. The dimension here is n. So even if our varieties are defined over any field, this part over here, we are doing over the real numbers. Because this is coming from passing to convex geometry after having a copy of the integers. That's why we are working here with Rn, even if our variety was over some uh, other field. Then a convex polyhedral cone is something that looks like this. You have a finite set of vectors, and what you do with those vectors is that you add them with some numbers in front. So lambda 1, v1, plus lambda 2, v2, plus lambda n, not n, because n, the name is already taken, lambda r, vr, and the only condition is that those lambdas that we are using are real numbers greater or equal than zero. That's what we are saying over here. So we have a finite set S. We take some vectors from there. And we form linear combinations like this where the scalars that we use are greater or equal than zero. In two dimensions, that might look something like this. So we have a first vector over here and a second vector over here. So I can form any vector that is of the form a non-negative scalar times the first vector that allows me to get all of these, a non-negative scalar times the second one that gives me all of these, but also sums of those things. So what we get would look like this. <clears throat> then the polyhedrality part is this finiteness, because one can also give a definition of cone that would allow circular things like this and many other things, just simply saying that I can scale with real numbers greater or equal than zero, but the ones that we want for these lectures have this extra word in them, like polyhedrality. So there are just, uh, there is a finite set of vectors. That would make our cone more look like. If you like, as we will see soon, they will look like intersecting finitely many half spaces. So you take a hyperplane through the origin and you take one side of that, like where some uh, functional is greater or equal than zero. So there is the place where the functional is zero, it's a hyperplane. You have one side where the functional is greater or equal than zero. You have one side where it's smaller or equal than zero. So take where the functional is greater or equal than zero, call that a half space. If you intersect finitely many of those, and in a certain, I mean, each of these is going to look like the intersection of finitely many uh, half spaces. Then let's now go over here. The word convex shows up here because it is convex, meaning the following if you have, in the sense of convex geometry, if you have um, two elements of your cone, of your convex polyhedral cone, and we take a lambda between zero and one, and you form this, what we call a convex combination of those guys, it is in there. Yes, because just from the definition, like this x, will, you can express in terms of the vi's like this, y, 
you can express in terms of the vi's with some lambda primes, but then now add this, it again has the same form. So you are safe. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, you could get all of Rn from a cone. Do we want to exclude that uh, from being a cone, or do we still consider it? It's a fantastic question. So the ones that we are going to care about are the ones that do not contain uh, lines. So now this is fine for these definitions, but the ones that will show up and will correspond to affine toric varieties, in addition, has something called being strongly convex which is, it doesn't contain a line. It will show up in a definition very soon. It will, we are going to exclude those, but I don't want to include them, exclude them at this point. We will exclude them in like in a couple of slides. It's a very good point. For these ones, we are okay with having uh, Arena as one of those, but then we will exclude them with an, extra, with an extra word in the name. You could exclude them at this point if you like, but I, I am following, uh, like this author chose to exclude them a little bit later. It's a good point, actually. Yeah, like if we allow those, what happens is that our toric varieties come with an extra factor of, uh, of C star, cross C star, cross C star. So we didn't have to exclude those, but we like to, because then it allows you to remove some factors that you can handle separately. So then again, to summarize, the question was, do you want to exclude things that have a line? Like for example, the whole RN, and the answer is yes, and we will exclude them in a couple of slides. Very good. So they are convex. And then uh, we'll see below that they are closed, but I can tell you the reason. The reason is that you can give an, a different characterization. These guys are intersections of finitely many half spaces, and each of those is closed. So it is an intersection of finitely many closed sets. Even arbitrary intersection of closed sets is closed, but this one is a finite intersection of closed sets. Even with um, point set topology, you already see that a set defined that form has to be closed. Yeah. Then some examples. Uh, the first quadrant in R2 satisfies this. Yes, because you can use uh, a vector, the standard vectors, E1 and E2. If I draw like this, and we take the standard vectors, say E1 and E2, as my set S, then we get all combinations of E1 and E2 with coefficients greater or equal than zero. That gives us precisely the first quadrant. Similarly, the first octant in R3, I can do by taking three vectors along uh, the, the positive part of the coordinate axis. And even more so, I can throw a bunch of other vectors because at this point there is no requirement of any type of minimality. Now one that can look a little bit more interesting and we'll keep on coming back to this one is as follows. In R3, take the cone generated by E1 so that one would be like over here. E2 would be like over here. E1 plus E3 would be up here. And E2 plus E3 would be up here. And then this one will be related to an example that we saw before. The, I can go back for a second and show you which one. One that we'll keep on revisiting throughout the lectures. Um, this one over here. Then the largest, this is related to the question from a moment ago. With the definition, we did not exclude uh, Rn at this point. The largest possible convex polyhedral cone, according to the definition we gave, is Rn itself. And then smallest, well, by the definition, it has to contain zero. You could, you could say if S is not empty, it contains zero clearly. If S is empty, you could still define that this is the cone associated to the empty set because this is like the combina linear combination of nothing is zero. So in any event, uh, this, is the, this cone is there, it's the smallest, and the whole array is the largest. And this is the 
point that we were talking about a moment ago, it is possible for cones, as we see over here, to contain entire lines. We don't want that for, because it creates extra factors of C star when we see our variety, so we can um, just handle those separately. So later we are going to introduce an extra word that's going to get rid of, uh, as an assumption, we are going to assume that this doesn't happen, but that will come later. Uh, for example, one cone that contains lines would be just generated by E1 and, e and minus E1 in R2, right? If you have R2 and you take E1 and minus E1, you get all of these, but you get all of these as well. So this is a convex polyhedral cone and it contains a line. It's just the x-axis. Similarly, if you, you can produce an example like this. That and this is the upper uh, half plane, the closed version of that, and also contains lines. Now we are going to use polytopes, I'll, I'll, I'll remind you the definition, uh, to get cones as well, and also to get toric varieties uh, in, our, in another lecture. A polytope is defined as follows. You take a finite set of uh, points in Rn, and you take a combination of those guys with scalars that are greater or equal than zero, but this is the new condition, they add to one. So this is going to look like as follows. If I take these five points plus some other points in here, what is going to look like will be like this, it will be this set. The name that people give to this is convex hull of those points. And one can see that this has to be inside every convex set that contains those points, right? If you have a convex set that contains those points, just by being convex it has to contain all of these. So it's contained inside the con uh, any convex set that contains those points. And it also you can easily check that it is convex. So then this would be like the intersection of like the convex sets that contain those particular points. And it would look like this. An example is over here. So here is the convex hull of this point, this one, this one, and one over here. The one is there, anyway, long story. So for is this ones that are the counter examples to Pick's theorem in dimension three? Anyway, we can talk about those someday. So polytopes including, polytopes include the following, like uh, n-gons, like with or without the word regular there. Like the word is just maybe thrown as, um, maybe rings a bell to, to some, some of us. As long as they're convex. Can you say that again? As long as they're convex. Yeah, it's a great point, yes. I, when I say like that, I, I mean convex, yes, you are right. And then polytopes include these regular convex and gons. Yes, like, uh, yeah, I used to not put the word, but you're right. Like, yeah, one could define some of those that are non convex, but I guess for me, it includes the word convex when I say that. But very good. Yeah, I need to be careful because for some people, it might not include the word convex when you say that. Like, uh, again, the comment was that when I say a regular and gone, for me, it includes the word convex, but maybe for some people, it doesn't. Uh, cubes, tetrahedra, octahedra, all of these are examples of polytopes. Very good. Let me see how far ahead I am. Very good, so what happens now? What is the size of this object? This size we are gonna call it dimension. And one can think for a second, what is the natural uh, notion of the size of these objects? And it yet one would come up with the actual answer. You want to, call the dimension of your cone, the dimension of the smallest of a space, denoted like this, contain, uh, spanned by this guy. The smallest of a space that contains the cone 
and you ask for the uh, dimension of that one and you define the dimension of your cone like that. So for example, uh, if your cone is a line like this, that would be contained in this line, so it's dimension one. If your cone is only the origin, so then the subspace that contains it is just the origin itself, which is dimension zero. For these ones, the smallest of a space that contains that is the whole thing, so that one is dimension two. Very good. And the notation for the smallest of a space containing these guys would be R sigma, and we call it the span of sigma. And as we, this is just repeating what we said, that the dimension of sigma is defined as the, as the dimension of R sigma. If we have one of these convex polyhedral cones, let's define the dual. The dual of this one is the set of elements in the dual Rn that when you evaluate, you get greater or equal than zero in your whole cone. Maybe let's take a moment to pass that. What are we saying over there? So I think this example helps. We have two copies of Rn. We have an initial copy of our n, if you want to call this one like the end that we start from, and then we have a dual copy of our n. You just our n again. And we are thinking of dot product between these two guys. We have a pairing given by dot product. So what we are going to ask is which <coughs> use somewhere here, use somewhere here, use somewhere here, for which one of these, if you do dot product with all of these ones, this is sigma, for which use, when we do dot product, we always get greater or equal than zero. The claim is that in this particular example is the ones in gray. If sigma is what we see in gray over here. The ones over here in gray give dot product greater or equal than zero with these guys. And if you are outside of this gray, you give negative with one of these guys. At least for a bit of intuition, let's see the extremal ones. Let's see these ones over here, these red ones. So that we are, we see that we are not lying. If we take one over here, if we take you over here, who is greater or equal than zero with this guy in red? Well, dot product with one zero or with something non-zero comma zero is just choosing the first coordinate. So when is that greater or equal than zero? First coordinate greater or equal than zero works over here. So then, yes, we are safe. You see? This guy is in there. Also, let me look at the other one, like on the other side, uh, one vector over here. And we ask, who is greater or equal than zero when you do dot product with this, say, u prime? Well, we look at the perp. We look at the perpendicular to that one, these would be the ones that do zero when dot product with uh, u prime. And then you can check that in the same direction are the ones that give you dot product greater or equal than zero. So for this u prime, it also works. And then one can see that when it works for two of them, it works for any convex combination of them. Not convex combination, like cone combination, like uh, greater or equal than zero scalars and adding those things. So at least this gray one is inside. And then the claim is that we will see that this is the actual answer. So the answer that is going to be coming soon is that you look at the perpendiculars to the extremal rays of this cone. 
in general, it will be like the phases of co-dimension one, dimension one than the total. You look at the perpendiculars that point inside, and then this answer is going to be the cone spanned by those directions, but that will be coming soon, <laughs> just getting ahead. So to be able to make precise the statement that I said of how to identify the dual, we need a little bit of notation. So if you take a vector that is non-zero on this dual side, we have the hyperplane of the vectors that do dot product equal zero with it. Okay. This is just a linear subspace of dimension n minus one. So we have a vector on the dual. It, it gives us a linear function on our n and is not zero. So then the kernel has to have dimension n minus one just by the dimension theorem. One just counts dimension. It has to be uh, dimension n minus one. So it's a hyperplane. We are going to denote it h sub u if the vector was u. And also we get a half space is the one I was mentioning a moment ago. Let's put a plus. This could be a little bit confusing because some people would use this notation with a plus for an strict inequality over here. But we are going to follow these notes where a plus means with um, inequality greater or equal than zero. So these ones are closed half spaces. And we are not going to use it, but we could define one with a minus. That would be the negative side. So given any u in the dual Rn, we are going to consider our Rn divided into three parts. That is the dot product equals zero, dot product greater or equal than, well, strictly, but then I'm going to take them close. So dot product greater or equal than zero and dot product smaller or equal than zero. Okay. So let's look at one example. Take sigma be a, just the convex polyhedral cone that we get out of some set S. I know this is an exercise for you guys to work out. And I included this exercise here because we refer to later on. We refer to it later on. So it turns out uh, you can get uh, this exercise and some other exercises later in the discussion session, but also you can download them from the website of uh, Professor Cohen. The dual is given by what is part A saying? In the definition, you had to do dot product greater or equal than zero with everybody in your cone. What this one is saying? Hey, it's just enough to do it with the generators. The elements of S we call the generators. It's not a unique. Uh, a cone has uh, many possibilities for infinitely many possibilities of choices of sets of generators. Anyway, for any choice of a set of generators, we are saying that it is enough to look at dot product greater or equal than zero with those. And additionally, if you take a um, V, this V gives us a close, similarly, right? If we did it taking a U on the dual side, I can think of the original one as the dual of the dual. So each V, gives us a half space in the dual. And then you can show that uh, you get the dual as intersecting these half spaces as we let F, uh, as we let V range on this um, generating set. Very good. Now let's see some examples. Right. Yes. Do you need any conditions on V because your closed half subspace was only defined for a non-zero element in the dual? Very good. So uh, we could keep it. I was even tempted to change the notes there. It's a good point. We could define as the whole thing, as the whole Rn, when you take a zero, and, okay. and yeah, yeah. it would not fit the name half space, but we could define H sub zero as the whole Rn, and then things work fine. Yeah, like it's, it's a good point. He's saying, hey, we could have thrown zero as in S, keeps S, uh, it keeps your cone the same. And then this would not be defined. Like if V is zero, this is not defined. So I'm saying like, just define it as same definition and it will give you Rn. And then 
everything works fine. Thank you for pointing this out. Then in this example, we are considering the cone that you see over here. E1, E2, E1 plus E3, and E2 plus E3. We saw this cone before. This cone was in example 1A, and maybe also in example 1.5, we say that it will come back. Uh, using this exercise, part A, we see that this cone is actually defined by the following inequalities. A greater or equal than zero, B greater or equal than zero, A plus C greater or equal than zero, and B plus C greater or equal than zero. Like because we are asking that you need to be greater or equal than zero when you dot, we do dot product with these four guys, but dot product greater or equal than zero with these four guys gives you these inequalities, you see? Okay, so we have now described this cone from those examples uh, using inequalities. Like this one, using inequalities, very good. Now, what about this one? Um, if we have this cone, is generated by E2 pointing upwards and E1 plus E2 over here. So E2 is over here and let me just draw it somewhere else. Down over here and the other one over here. So this is these two guys. And then uh, this guy is sigma and the dual are like over here and using 1, 4, B, that says that the dual can be described this way, just using the elements from S, we can see that the dual is therefore the half space associated to E1 plus E2, and the half space intersected the half space associated to E2. In other words, is this half space associated to um, E2, would be this one over here, so stuff that does dot product with E2 greater or equal than zero, and stuff that does dot product with E1 plus E2 greater or equal than zero, that's this over here. So it's the intersection of those two, so we recover this gray one. Very good. We next discuss the phases of a cone. So what are the phases of a cone? Let's take a tau, the intersection of your cone with a very special type of half space. It's a half space that puts your sigma on one side. So we said we have given you, you is just like, you wanna make this concrete? We are in Rn and another copy of Rn that you consider to do dot product. And you take you, you use a tuple of real numbers. And you are just saying, when you do dot product with your fixed tuple, you get the kernel, the meaning where it is zero, and we have two half spaces. We are going to ask that the cone is on one side, and the intersection with the cone is what we call a face. So let me draw like a picture over here. Say that we have something looking like this and extending upwards infinitely, and this is like the origin. So what we are saying is take a half space. Imagine like if I had something that contains this face over here. Like if you could go from that face and consider it span. So imagine that. So what I am assuming here is that the cone is on one side of that hyperplane. So what is a face again? Is the intersection of your cone with a hyperplane as long as your cone is on one side. And it is what one intuitively would imagine one wants a face to be. So. Uh, if I do it two-dimensional and I draw like a cone over here, a two-dimensional cone over here, so then the faces for this one, we would also want to include the possibility of the whole thing being a face. So uh, we want the faces to be the whole thing 
plus things that arise from uh, intersection of half spaces. In that case, one would like to just allow z u to be zero, which will give you the whole thing. So in this case, the phases would be if you intersect with a half, half space like this and take the intersection, you would say that this one that I'm doing in red is a phase. Maybe orange and red are so close that I should use a different color. This green one would be a phase. Also, this blue one would be a phase. Also, if we intersect, say, with a half space like this, the whole cone is on a side, and the intersection is the origin only. So the origin for this cone that I drew is also a phase. And as I was saying, if you, you can just say that the whole thing is a phase by definition, or allow you to be equal zero, but in any event, we want uh, the whole thing to be a phase. So that would be a fourth phase of this thing. So then the whole thing. So the phases would be one, two, three, and four over here for this one, and similarly for other uh, for cones of other dimensions. Uh, phases that are not the whole sigma, you call proper phases. And notice that since we have sigma like this, uh, this happens if and only if u is in the dual. So, um, yeah, because we want that this cone the cone is in this half space. So it means that the cone does dot product greater or equal than zero with u. But we have a name for that. It means u is in the dual. These two things are, when one writes down what they mean, one writes down exactly the same thing, so they are if and only if. Then the phases you can detect by letting u vary over the non-zero elements of the dual cone. And I guess, as I was pointing out, one also wants to include the whole thing as a phase. And then we can see a lemma over here. If you take a cone with some finite generating set, uh, we have this convex polyhedral cone, the faces themselves, one can show that they are convex polyhedral cones. One can show that the intersection of two faces is again a face, and one can show that a face of a face is again a face. We will care about this for a definition that we will introduce soon of a fan. And then there is the definition of a facet. Uh, we are going to use the name facet to denote um, a, fa a facet of one of these convex polyhedral cones is going to be a face that is not the whole thing, but just size one less. So a size, a, a face of dimension, co-dimension one, dimension one less than the dimension of your cone. So, for example, in this one that I drew on top, the facet would be these two lines over, uh, these two segments over here, these two rays actually. The name for this is rays. So this one has four faces. Two of them are facets. And for the one that I drew over here, there would be like three facets. You would be like, this one in green is one of them. And if that picture is making sense of what I mean over there. This one over here would be a second one, and then there is a one in the back. That would be a third one. There is one over there in the back. That would be like a third one. So those are the facets. And then one can prove that every proper face is the intersection of the facets that contain it. For example, if you look at this ray over here, it would be the intersection of the facet that is marked in green and the one that is marked in blue. What we are saying over here is that one can prove that is not a coincidence, that's always true. If you have a face, you get to that face by intersecting the facets that contain it. A good references for the proof of this, you can try to prove them directly, but also uh, in the book of, not just in the notes, uh, Going to the book, there is a book of ontology varieties by David Cox and some other co-authors, uh, Cox Little Schenk, and over there you see the proofs of all of these, and also in the first section 
of the book of toric varieties of Fulton is about convex geometry, and then he will establish all of these facts. I think that for the last few moments, I might need to uh, plug to continue, so I'm going to finish from over here. Sorry about that. Okay, then um, we are going to represent the facets like this, and then when we do this, every facet can be represented like this, right? And then we say that U is an inner pointing facet normal, or simply a, a facet normal. What are we saying over there? Yes, for this example that I have over here, what would be the inner pointing uh, facet normal would be a vector there. This is an inner pointing facet normal for the green one. One for the blue one will look like this. And the, in the examples that, let me go back a couple of slides, in the examples over here, the inner pointing facet normals are this guy and this guy. They are normal and they point inward. For normal vectors, I have two choices, one pointing outward and then one pointing inward. So we want to choose, to choose that one. And then let's go back to the example I just showed. In this example that we have these ones, these are the inner pointing facet normals. And then when we notice that the dual cone, the dual cone is spanned by those, you see? And then what we are going to say now is that this is not a coincidence. It's a theorem that says the following. If we have a n-dimensional convex polyhedral cone in Rn, and assume that it's not the whole Rn, then um, we let the facets to be defined like this. So since they are n-dimensional, there is basically a unique choice for those of positive scaling. Then what we are saying is that sigma is the intersection of these guys, and sigma dual is the cone spanned by those, just like we see over here. So these guys, the first part over there is saying that if we look at these guys and we do the half spaces, we get sigma. Sigma is the half spaces coming from these guys over here. And the dual is the span of those inner uh, pointing normals here. And one more thing that one can prove as well, one proves that one, which motivates the use of the word dual, is that if you do the dual of the dual, you get the original code. So it's here at the bottom, the dual of the dual cone is the original. And now we're going to talk about these ones, introducing... Uh, Sorry, can you just go back real quick? Yes. So we are going to talk about these strongly convex polyhedral cones. A convex polyhedral cone is strongly convex if the following four things here that are equivalent happen. But one of them is this, that if you take the cone and you intersect with the same cone, but just like doing the reflection over the origin of each vector, that's just the notation minus sigma over there, you get only the origin. But this can be characterized in all of these ways. So, sigma is strongly convex, meaning this intersection of sigma and um, this one minus sigma is zero. To make it concrete, imagine that we are in the first quadrant, and that's your sigma, minus sigma would be this, and then the intersection of those two is only the origin. So then this one is uh, strongly convex. 
but other characterizations are as follows. It contains no positive dimensional subspace. In other words, it contains no lines. It would contain no lines. That is a characterization of strongly convex. So, for example, the whole arc M would not satisfy this because it would contain some lines. And zero is a phase. We can see that zero is a phase of the first quadrant in R2. Then you see that it's a different way to see that the first quadrant in R2 is strongly convex. And a different characterization is that you look at the dual. And for example, if I take the cone that would be a half space in R2, If I am in R2 and I take the top half space and I ask myself who is greater or equal than zero dot product with all of those guys, I end up with this answer. It has to be only this pattern. No other vector works. A dot product greater or equal than zero with those guys. And what is happening there is that there is a line inside this code. Look, the dual got tiny. Yes, because you need to do dot product greater or equal than zero at the same time with E1 and minus E1. So you are in trouble over there. So it has to be only that red one that I drew. So the dual got tiny when this one contained the line that I'm going to draw over here. So then what is happening? This other characterization. You contain no lines if and only if the dual has full dimension. And one of the corollaries of this proposition is that we just, by looking at what we said over there, is that if you have a sigma that is strongly convex of maximal dimension, then so is the dual. Yes, because this gives us that uh, it is of maximal dimension. And then since the origin, of the dual of the dual is the dual, we see that uh, it is a strong, the dual is strongly convex because the original one was top dimensional, was n dimensional. So we apply this same thing to the dual, and then deduce that the dual is also strongly convex. Now, we are going to use this name. It's more common to call it rays, but also some people call it edges, of a convex polyhedral cone is the one-dimensional faces. So in the pictures that I have been drawing, if we have a cone like this, the rays would be these two. This red one is one ray, and this one is another one. These are like the two rays. Very good. And then, if we have sigma that is strongly convex, we can use the edges to get a specially nice sets of generators. Yes, as you can see here, <laughs> when I zoomed, I don't know what you see, but I guess that was. Very good. Is it weird? Yes. Yeah, I guess it's fine. It's what I intended. So um, then, if you get a strongly convex polyhedral cone with these edges, what you can do is choose a vector along each of those. So we go here and choose one vector in each of the edges. And then the claim, which is very believable and easy to show is that those guys give you generators. So the cone is generated by those guys. And moreover, is minimally generated by those guys, although you can change them by scale. So what is happening is if you don't put one vector from each of the rays, then when you take the cone over that, you are not going to reach those rays. So you have to, you must have those guys inside up to some scalar. But then this is telling us that that's enough. If you take one vector from each ray, you get your cone and it's a minimal generating set. Meaning you need those guys up to some scalar and they work. And then again, the minimality is in the sense that you are allowed to change those guys up to a positive scale. 
and we call that a minimal generating set of your code. It is not unique because you can scale each of the elements, but it is fine. The, yes, please. Could an edge be zero? No, like by definition, it is one dimension. But then why is why should vi be pi minus? <laughs> Let me take a look at mine. Oh, yes, those are the generators. Yes, like you are taking, let me do one more, let me look at one picture from before. What we are saying is, and really this one is easier to see, what we are saying is, uh, if I'm working with this particular cone, take one vector in this ray and one vector in this ray. Okay. If you are working with this cone, just take one vector from this ray and any, for example, very far from this ray. He's saying that those guys generate the cone and I need a multiple of the first and a multiple of the second one always, no matter what set of generators they choose. For example, in this one, I could use one from here, one here, and one here. That generates the cone, and I need a multiple of each of those guys to generate it. And I think that this is a good time to stop, and what we are going to do next time will be to continue from here, which we are going to introduce the extra notion of rationality, which is going to be saying that our generating set is going to come from points with integer coordinates. And then we'll continue from there. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention today. If there are any questions, I'll be very happy to. Yes, please. What exercise is that you all work on? Could you please say that again? We're going to have that as an exercise? We could. Like, a, is that the question? Yeah, my question was the dual of a cone is still a cone. The dual of a cone, it depends on. Uh, yes, because you can scale, yes. Like, the, if we define just the word cone by itself as some set where I can do uh, greater or equal than zero scaling. And then I have a cone, and I take an element u that is in the dual. It means it does greater or equal than zero dot product with all of these guys, and I multiply this u by a scalar lambda greater or equal than zero. Then the same is true because I will simply be multiplying some numbers greater or equal than zero with a number, num a number greater or equal than zero. So yes, the dual of the cone will still be a cone. And even with uh, adding extra words, extra adjectives to that, it's true. Like the dual of a cone is a cone, the dual of a polyhedral cone is a polyhedral cone, the dual with the new word Russian polyhedral, polyhedral cone is going to be a Russian polyhedral cone. One that would not is this is strongly convex. We just had an example a moment ago, a strongly convex uh, cone, the dual might not be strongly convex, but it's but like it would be fixed if you take it top dimensional. If it is top dimensional now, the dual of a top dimensional strongly convex Russian polyhedral cone, each of those words give you the other one for the dual. Yes, please. Does the Curry structure uh, depend on the choice of the action? I guess in principle you could have on the same variety maybe different structures. I mean, yes, like we are, we are fixing a structure. So we are fixing an open set, and then we are using that one for the structure of toric variety. But I guess in principle, one could do some just automorphism and take a different set that is also isomorphic to a torus, and then take a. So, for example, they try to give things that are isomorphic as varieties, but not as toric varieties. I, I, I think that we should be able to write down some of those examples. Yes, please. Okay. Are you being asked you to prove that if you take the double door of the polyhedral cone, that's again every property of the cone? Maybe let me prepare it for next time. I, I think that it follows as you are proving the other two. Like that one, like by itself, is tougher, but if you prove the other two, it's not bad. Like uh, maybe I'll, I, I'll think of a, I'll, I'll present it shortly next time. Yes, please. Uh, I think one of your early example, examples was the affine cone of the, the gray embedding, yes. which you, you already proved was a torque variety.
already? Is that like a general phenomenon? Of like, do you have a projected sort variety and take the affine cone? Take the affine cone of the laboratory variety. I guess yes, because you could do uh, an extra, you just up the dimension by one, you just have a like, copy of C like this, and then you have a C star that you can make act on this one. Like this one thing, you have the issue of normality. Like, uh, so if you allow non normal toric varieties, uh, I think in some cases you might end up with not normal things, but if you allow like uh, non normal toric varieties, you will for sure get one of those. Normality is the only thing that can go wrong, but yes, you get an extra C star action, and the dimension went up by one, and then now you have an old torus that is the old torus cross C star, and then you can act just like on, on these lines like this or in the code, and then yes. I mean, there, be, there could be issues of normality at the, at the vertex of the cone. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. Okay, then. Very good. Thank you.